great to see everyone this morning, this beautiful Lord's Day. I hope that everyone brought their Bibles. I hope that everyone's willing to turn and to follow and to study along. This morning we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6. One of the great things about the book of Corinthians is it gives us so much insight on how we have relationships with each other and how we have relationships with the world and how different those relationships are. That there are problems that will arise. There are things that will come up that have to be addressed and have to be looked at. There are so many things that take place inside the Bible. And one of the things that I find so amazing is how the gospel that was written in the first century can apply throughout all ages and all times. God is a powerful God, isn't he? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, there is a problem going on at Corinth. He said, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. There is an inappropriate relationship going on in Corinth. He said it's so bad that the Gentiles don't even do this. We've read quite a bit about what was going on in the Gentiles' world on, on Revelation class on Wednesday night. We see so many of the bad things that were going on. He says not even in their world are they doing the things that's happening here. That's a serious charge, isn't it? That's a serious accusation that he's saying. He's saying there's something going on here that's wrong. There's something going on here that's sinful. There was sin going on in the congregation at Corinth in many different ways. But this is one of the ways in particular there was an individual having an inappropriate relationship with his stepmother. This was something so far out that the Gentiles wouldn't even touch it with a ten foot pole, as we say. They wouldn't get near it. It was considered way far out there that something like this would even happen. But it's happened. And it's happening inside the church. And so they have to, what do we do about this? How do we address this situation? But unfortunately for them, they weren't looking at it that way. They had a different mentality about it. In verse 2 it says, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he which has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So instead of saying, how can we fix this? How can we address this? They, it says they were puffed up, which means they didn't want to look at it. If we don't see it, it'll go away. If we just, if we just turn a blind eye, we'll never have to deal with this situation. Now they're having to deal with a lot of things in this congregation now. They're having to deal with Pharisees that are coming in trying to trick the congregation. They're having to deal with all the false teachers that are trying to get them. But they're having to deal with this one particular situation because it's with a member of their own family. And he said, instead of dealing with it, he said, they're puffed up. They, they didn't want to mourn about it. They just wanted to pretend it never happened. Let's sweep it under the rug. Never have to deal with it. If we never have to touch it, there won't be a problem. And rather not mourn that he who have done this deed might be taken away from among you. You see, they had gotten lukewarm. And we know how God sees lukewarm, don't we? God said, I'd rather you be hot. I'd rather you be cold, but since you're not hot and you're not cold, you're lukewarm. Lukewarm is a dangerous temperature. He said, since you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out. He said, I don't want anything to do with lukewarm. Be one or the other. Pick a side. You know, that's one of the things in the world that we even see as, as a human side of things. We don't want someone who's, well, I, I like this side in the battle, and I, and I like that side in the battle, so I'm just going to sit in the middle and see who wins. We don't, we don't have very much respect for that person, do we? We want to know whose side are you on? Who are you going to pick here? There is no middle ground when it comes between Satan and God, is there? You're either on one side or you're on the other. So here they are. They, they don't want to address the situation. They've allowed themselves to become lukewarm. They're blinded. They could not admit that someone in their own family could commit such a grievous sin. That's why they're puffed up. They couldn't believe it. One of us, there's no way we would commit a sin. They did not see the need for addressing the situation that was in their midst. He said in verse 3, For verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have I judged already as though I were present concerning them which have done this deed. So he's saying, I'm not there. I'm not there physically. But I've already made a judgment. And you're going to have to make a judgment. Because I made the judgment already. Since the judgment's been made, you have to carry it out. You have to follow through with it. You have to go along with it. Paul was not there, but he gave them a judgment. And if he gave the judgment, it's just as if he's there, isn't it? Christ doesn't come down and speak directly to us and say, Okay, now Travis, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He doesn't have to do that, does he? No, because he's given us a judgment. He's saying, Okay, Christians. Does that include 
All Christians? All Christians. Okay, now go and teach. All of us have that letter. All of us have that command. All of us must carry that out. We have the same com command to carry out the commands of Christ as Paul has to carry out the commands of Christ. They didn't have the freedom to change that command. They couldn't alter it. They couldn't move it around. They couldn't say, oh, I just don't like this one. I think we should do something a little different. Paul, I just don't think we should obey that command. That's a bad one. They didn't have the freedom to do that, did they? They didn't have the freedom to change his command. He says concerning him. That's important. She was not a member of the church. So his command couldn't be for them to have a discussion between him and her in this way. Couldn't do it. Couldn't carry it out that way. Why? She's not even a member of the church. How can you withdraw from her? How can there be church discipline for someone that's not in the church? So he focuses on him because this man was a member of the Lord's body. The, the Corinthian church of Christ. <laughs> And he says, there's something going on concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. He so he says, when the congregation comes together, everybody meet up, everybody assemble. When everybody gets together to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He says, deliver him over to Satan. What does he say? He's saying, fine, if that's what he wants to do, if he wants to keep doing that, let him do it. Let him go on and have his life. Let him decide, what do I want more? Do I want God more, or do I want Satan more? Is something more precious to me than God? That's what he's saying. If that's what they want, turn them over already to it. But withdraw yourself from them in an attempt to save their soul. Pull away from them so that they miss you. Pull away from them so that they miss that relationship that they have. They're already lost. Think about that. They're already lost. If I don't say anything, they're going to stay lost forever. You know, there's going to come a day when their soul will stand in judgment. They're going to stand before the Lord Almighty and give an account. If I say nothing, it is 100% assured they will be lost. If I say something, there is a chance they might respond. There is a chance they might do right. Now, there is a chance they'll harden their heart. And they'll say, you know what? I'm never going back there. I'm never going to talk to them again. But that's not your fault. You know, the same thing happened in the Bible. They confronted Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you're doing wrong. What did Pharaoh say? Pharaoh hardened his heart and said, I'm not going to change. You can't make me change. Ahab did the same thing. Ahab, you caused Israel to sin. I didn't cause Israel to sin. You caused Israel to sin. The same thing happens. Many times when people are confronted with sin, they deny, reject, and get angry and say, I'm closed, I'm done, I'm not having anything else to do. But that doesn't change our response, does it? Amen. We're still required to keep the law of Christ. So this withdrawn man, if he chooses to keep on sinning, or if this man chooses to keep on sinning, he chooses to refuse to do the right thing, he chooses to disobey God willingly, then there's no choice for the congregation other than to get away from him, to deliver such an one. This is not just for his soul, though. It's for all of us. It's for every New Testament Christian. Because there is a danger. There is a very clear and a present danger that goes along with someone who's choosing to live sinfully, willfully. There is a danger that goes with that. There is a danger of spreading. It's like gangrene. If you get gangrene, it starts to move and grow and fester and spread and grow until there's such a point that it's killed the entire body. It's a dangerous thing. It's a terrible thing. They're putting themselves and other people in danger. Notice what he says in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. He says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition received of us. For yourselves know that how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. If, verse 14, for if any man 
obey not our word by this epistle. Notice what he says. Note that man. Note them and have no company with them that they may be ashamed. Yet count them not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Don't be mean to him. Don't call him names. Don't gossip about him. Don't push him in the mud. But at the same time, you have to remember something. This person is a danger to themselves and to you. Amen. For example, if somebody was outside right now in the front parking lot, they had a chainsaw revved up, and they're flailing around in circles, are you going to walk towards them or run away from them? Are you going to reach your hand out and say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll, let me help you out. Or will you stand back and say, There's nothing. you need to stop. That's dangerous. You're going to hurt yourself or somebody else. The same thing goes with sin. It is a dangerous thing that's hurting the person and others around them if they get too close. They are still our brother, but they're living in a sinful lifestyle. We still love them as though they're family. <coughs> and we have to treat them differently. This is for one who will not obey God. This is for someone who's been confronted, for someone who's been spoken to, for something that's been addressed, and they say, I don't care, I'm not going to change. That's what this is for. This is not for just any situation. Johnny made a mistake. It's not that kind of a thing. This is the kind of thing for someone who has decided they will not follow God. In verse 14, it says to have no company with him. That's 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 14. That's not to be associated with him. We don't go fishing. We don't go hunting. We don't play video games together. We don't watch football games together. We don't associate with each other. We're still nice. We still talk. I'll still encourage you to come back. I'll still encourage you to do right. But I can't spend time with you. We don't turn away from them if they offer an extended handshake. But we remind them that we miss them. We look for an opportunity to bring them back to Christ. Amen. They are still family, and as such, they are still loved, and they are still cared about. But at the same time, they're dangerous. Amen. They're dangerous to themselves and to others. He says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6, He says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Their glorying was that they would think that would never happen amongst us. It's not possible that such a thing could happen amongst us. But their lifestyle is sin spread. So it's not good. Don't you know that just a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? You drop a little leaven onto this side, it spreads to the whole thing. It moves in and out. There's no ignoring it. There's no good coming from it. There is only danger, and the command is to get them away. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, he tells us how to do that. He says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you might be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Remove the sinful lifestyles and the sinful people away from you so that you can become a brand new lump. Amen. So that you can become a pure peace. Purge it out. Remove them. Deliver them to their own desires. In Romans 1 and verse 28, God said that he saw the wickedness of the people. He saw the sinfulness that was going on. And it says, he gave them over to a reprobate mind. That means God said, okay, if that's what you want, have at it. You'll answer for it, but have at it. The same thing is commanded of us. If that's what they truly desire in life, then we can say to them, if that's what you truly want, you have the freedom to choose. Have at it. But I can't be a part of that. I can't associate with that. By withdrawing from them, you're removing them from amongst yourselves and purifying the body. Amen. Getting it clean. Verse 9. He says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Yet not altogether the fornicators of this world, or the covetous, or the extortioners, or the idolaters. For then you must needs go out of the world. But 
But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be fornicator, or covetous, or idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, and with such an one know not to eat. He says if someone is living this kind of lifestyle, not they made a mistake, not they have, they've done something, but they choose to live in a life of sin, if they do that, don't eat with them. But notice what he says in particular. He says we can't do that from everyone in the entire world. There's a difference between the world and our brothers. If we were going to do that to the entire world, we'd have to leave the world. We'd have to fly out of the planet to do that. He said, but if there's someone that's called a brother in particular, there's a special relationship between us. If someone is a brother in Christ, but they choose to live a sinful life, and they have no intention of changing, we cannot eat with them. We can't invite them over to our house. Sin is serious, isn't it? Sin is so serious, it costs our Lord a physical, painful, violent death. Sin is serious, and it affects everyone. It affects everyone. He says, verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do ye not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. He says, that guy that's doing that, remove him. He's not saying he can't come to church. He's not saying when he comes to the door, block him. He's saying that person cannot have your association. He says, dare any of you. Now we're moving into chapter 6. He says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Members of the church were taking their brothers and sisters to court before unbelievers. Can you imagine that? Paul said, dare any of you do such a thing? Saints going before the unjust against matters for each other. He says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the saints are judged, and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? He said, if you're going to be responsible at the judgment day to stand with Christ, if you're going to be that responsible, you can't judge among yourselves even small matters in life. Things that will fade from this life. He says, verse 3, Know ye not that we shall judge the angels? How much more things that pertain to this life. We have a responsibility to stand, to stand with God against those angels who fell in judgment. We're going to stand there with them. So if we cannot handle our own matters, how will we handle such a giant task on judgment day? He said, if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed among, or least esteemed in the church. If you have problems, settle it in the church. Don't take it to court. Why would he say such a thing? Why would he say don't take your problems to court? Here's why. That court's unbelief. It's full of non-Christians. Do you know what they see? Me as a Christian arguing with my brother who was a Christian and we're fighting and if we can't get along why would they want to be a part of us? Think about that for a moment. He says we should not be taking problems to the world. If somebody has a problem, especially the world, the world should come to us. We're the place the world comes to, aren't we? <laughs> if you're looking for salvation, who do you go to? If you're looking for healing, who do you go to? If you're looking for compassion and you're looking for mercy, who do you go to? We should be going to the church, shouldn't we? So to settle a small matter, who should we bring things before the church? In verse 5, he says, I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one, that shall be able to judge between these brethren. He says it's shameful to take a brother to court. He says, is there not a wise person in the entire congregation that can settle the matter that's happening here? That's something we should all consider, isn't it? Is there not someone wise enough that can say, okay, here's how to solve this problem without taking a brother <coughs> in Christ to court? He says, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, there is, there, there, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. He says, it is a fault 
to take your brother to court. It is wrong, utterly, in the eyes of God, to sue, to take your brother to court before unbelievers. God sees sin seriously, doesn't he? He says, you don't do that. You don't behave that way. You don't act that way. There's a whole lot of things he talks about here, doesn't he? He talks about things from top to bottom. He talks about how we respond to each other. He talks about the seriousness of sin. He talks about how we are to act between one and another. He talks about the seriousness that comes along with some particular things. Lifestyle, particularly. Sin separates from God. That's how serious sin is. Sin separates from God. When one lives in sin and is unwilling to repent, the church has no option but to, but to withdraw. That's a command. That's just as much as a command as to take of the Lord's Supper. That's just as much as a command to sing. That's just as much as a command to pray. That's just as much as a command as any other command in the entire Scripture. That if someone chooses not to follow God, there are consequences that go along with that. God tells us how to treat each other, doesn't he? Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Here's how you respond. Here's how you treat someone else. Here's how you talk to someone else. That, that is his command for us. Treat one another with love. Don't mistreat one another. Don't take each other to court. Don't live in sin. Don't threaten others. There are many things that can be found just in the first book of Corinthians. Serious topics. Some things are Paul gives sarcasm about. Other things Paul is as serious as a heart attack. There's a lot of things in life that happen. Where is your soul this morning? How do you feel that if you were to die right now, where would you go? Where would your soul be? Perhaps there's someone here this morning that's not a New Testament Christian. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He said, lest you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Are you willing to repent of your sins? Acts 2.38, he said, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of your sins. Perhaps there's someone here that's never confessed that He is the Lord. He said, unless you confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father. And then to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And then to live faithfully. To live a faithful life. That if we have a lifestyle or we have something constantly taking place in our lives that needs to change, we need to do that publicly. If you have any need, don't delay. It. Come now while we stand up. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I can.